Hello, everyone. Welcome to Istio's webinar on documentary filmmaking in Russia and the USSR. My name is Dima Frangulov. Let me switch on the light so we can see you me better. And I'm vice president at Istio. And with me here are two of my colleagues, uh, Carolyn Fennell and Sergei Smirnov. Sergei, say hi. We're planning to have the presentation for about an hour, maybe a little bit more, which will be followed by the uh, Q&A session. I must say that this session is being recorded. And those of you who would like to uh, get a copy of it, please let us know by sending a message or, or uh, an email. You can also type your questions that you may have during the presentations in the chat box down below here. And Carolyn will forward them either to one of the presenters or to Sergey and me. Um, we plan to have two presenters today, but I uh, one of them hasn't shown up yet. So uh, I would like uh, to express my sincere pleasure to uh, introduce one of our presenters, Maria Vinogradova. Maria, say hello. And uh, Maria is a film and media historian specializing in the study of Soviet nonfiction and amateur films. She's currently working on the book manuscript on the public rails, a history of Soviet amateur filmmaking. Her research has been twice sponsored by American Council of Learned Science, uh, Societies fellowships. She has taught courses in film history, theory and research methods, methods at Pratt Institute and Brooklyn College. Maria has produced The Village Detective, a song cycle, an experimental documentary on the Soviet actor Mikhail Zharov, which is directed by Bill Morrison. Maria, the uh, floor is yours. Dmitry, I am very glad to um, speak as a part of this uh, webinar. So the research that, me, that, that Dmitry has uh, mentioned in his introduction has uh, led me to become aware of how many uh, film collections of historical uh, significance are currently uh, neglected in Russia and what a rich potential uh, source for uh, historians, uh, filmmakers, uh, students and other interested uh, persons this uh, could be. So today I will speak about one of them and uh, the, uh, I have become aware of it almost 10 years ago and in the last um, three years I have been actively uh, working um, on the uh, acquisition of this uh, collection by NYU Libraries which um, the, the project had to be uh, stopped for a variety of reasons but the collection is uh, still uh, there and me Dmitry has approached me about a month ago uh, because uh, this collection, he told me, could be of potential interest for East Views, a new streaming platform, which I was very excited to learn uh, about. My understanding is that uh, among the audience for today's event, uh, many uh, have uh, worked with East Views uh, collections, and that was my case in the course of my research. I think um, the uh, way East View has arranged this uh, materials, the way it created metadata, really uh, creates an invaluable uh, resource for uh, scholars. And uh, sometimes I, I'm able to find the same collections elsewhere on the internet, but I cannot work with them in the same way. So uh, I was thinking that uh, potentially Eastview could um, create something uh, related to uh, motion, historical motion pictures that parallels it, its work uh, with uh, textual sources. So this is Shkol Film. I will share my screen right now to show a few slides that will help me to uh, tell you what this collection is. And I will hit uh, the full screen mode and I'll be switching between slides. Uh, please let me know if there are any issues or with that. Um, so Shkol Film. You, uh, right here on the screen, you see uh, a logo for uh, for this uh, company. Um, th this was the Soviet um, authority um, that uh, created uh, a, a films for oh sorry, uh, films for um, secondary um, edu educational for secondary uh, schools and distributed them on 16 millimeter film. So first it was founded as a central film laboratory of the Ministry of Enlightenment of the Russian Soviet Federation. And that was in the late 1930s. Um, so it became uh, really active in the early 60s, the period when uh, there was generally a great diversity of uh, 
uh, filmmaking in the Soviet Union and a lot of interest in uh, nonfiction and uses of films outside of theatrical screenings. Uh, it was a social school film. Uh, films were distributed through uh, regional and local departments of education. This means that every city had at least one, but uh, in the case of larger cities, that was uh, more. So a collection of uh, school film where uh, teachers uh, could uh, borrow films for uh, their classes. And um, those films were discarded en masse during the post-Soviet uh, period. However, in the very, very early 90s, school film films continued uh, to be created uh, by the way do you see the slide illustrating the points i'm making right now okay making sure just making sure thank you um so they were dis discarded uh, en masse but um so some of them were still made in the early 90s and according to the uh, slips we found in uh, some of the reels uh, they continued to be checked out by teachers until the mid 1990s however uh, the end of the soviet union um, corresponded roughly with obsolescence of celluloid film as a medium so uh, those films were discarded both because video um, has quickly replaced um, uh, celluloid film as the main um, medium for um, non-theatrical educational uh, uh, film presentation, and also because everything Soviet seemed uh, obsolete uh, at times. Um, so oftentimes those collections were uh, picked up by former projectionists uh, who uh, also were gradually uh, pushed out of work because of the onset of the digital age. And they, at the same time, they were the people who were really able to appreciate the experience of an analog uh, film screening. So uh, this is the context in which uh, collections such as uh, school film were preserved. Although it's hard to call it preservation because oftentimes we find these collections sitting in uh, attics in less than adequate, um, stored in less than adequate conditions. And uh, also uh, these enthusiasts uh, have digitized um, some of those films. So right now there are uh, low resolution digital copies uh, of some of them circulating on uh, YouTube. And again, most extant prints today are likely in collections of former film projectionists. So Krasnogorsk State Archives catalog yields just 119 uh, titles. Um, so in the collection uh, we um, have worked with, uh, it is at least uh, 400. So uh, this is, again, this is the, um, what, what the collection is. It is uh, between uh, 400 and 500 titles, and it is hard to uh, tell for sure, because out of uh, the over 1,200 reels that uh, we have examined, there are uh, some films that are on two reels, and um, also the, a few that there are, uh, there are a few titles that repeat themselves. So we haven't done the exact count yet, but it, it is between four and five hundred titles. Uh, there are also uh, seven hundred twenty-three materials identified as fragments. What are fragments? So th those are not finished films with a narrative uh, structure, but usually they just help teachers to demonstrate some uh, process. And uh, here is the person who. Uh, preserved this collection. His name is Alexander Shirbanosov. He is uh, a television um, professional uh, working uh, on local on the local television in Saint Petersburg. He is also an enthusiast for uh, local history, and uh, he began his experience with uh, motion pictures began in the uh, 1980s when he was involved in the amateur film cir uh, circles. Um, he is again in general. Uh, an enthusiast of uh, history and archival film. He uh, created 21 issues of the program Unseen uh, Cinema on the internet channel uh, Iskustva TV or RTV, each featuring one to three uh, short amateur films from the 80s and early 90s. And those uh, issues can be found on well, YouTube. Maria, Maria, I'm sorry, Maria. I don't, I don't think your slides are showing. So can you... Oh. Uh, yeah. Thank Switch. you. Thank you for letting me know. Do you see? Uh, now, it, we, now, like we this? now we can. Okay. So I guess I will uh, have to. I will have to do it uh, this way. Okay. So um, 
and he is the person who um, who uh, preserved uh, this, um, uh, who, who stored this uh, collection. So he explained to me that uh, when a certain school film facility was closing down in the 90s, he had been familiar with them. So they asked him, uh, we are about to throw them away. Will you pick them up? And so he came and picked them up. And um, uh, this is uh, a, a, a simple piece of paper that they gave him listing what uh, he was getting. So uh, he wrote a formal request, please uh, give us, uh, you know, this collect, uh, collection of 16 millimeter films in the amount. And here is the amount of black and white and color films and uh, fragments. So I have translated uh, that uh, below. And so uh, initially, uh, we uh, so, so uh, there, there was a project with NYU Libraries to acquire that uh, collection to complement other non-theatrical Soviet films uh, currently in its uh, holdings. Um, so the, the three of us, um, uh, myself, Ala Roylands, uh, the librarian for Russian and Slavic uh, Eastern European Studies at NYU Libraries, and Kim Tar, the, um, the preservation specialist. Uh, we arrived in St. Petersburg and found the collection just packed in uh, mesh bags used to carry potatoes and, and um, other similar uh, things. And uh, there is a, big, a group picture of us, but because I haven't got a, an explicit permission from the other two people in the picture to show it, I will skip this slide. slide. I will sh just show a picture of myself working um, as a part of uh, that group. Uh, later, a few months later, I discovered that I, what I was wearing was the KN95 mask, still in short supply. Uh, back then, I didn't know it was a thing. So uh, we just uh, brought, you know, it was all extremely informal. Uh, we just uh, rented an apartment where we brought uh, all these films and uh, we spent um, almost two weeks uh, working with them. And I also continued for another week after Kim and Ala left. So we would just um, lay them out on the floor like this. It's, it's a part of the, uh, it's a part of the whole uh, collection. And um, we inspected, uh, so, so we, we inspected the first 120 cans, but because the time was so scarce, what we did was mainly trying to arrange them to prepare for shipment. But here are some, uh, examples of um, some of the materials that we got as we were expecting the uh, collection. And I will actually uh, zoom in because I think it will appear a bit larger on the screen. So let's do it like this. Um, so uh, whenever there was a can, uh, in most situations we would find uh, this slip called technical passport. And it, uh, among other things, it uh, gives information on when the specific reel was checked out. So this is how we uh, found out that some of them were checked out uh, still in the uh, 90s. So here is one example of a title, Historical Memorials of Bukhara. So Bukhara is the city in uh, Central uh, Asia currently Uzbekistan. Another one, uh, struggle um, against, um, a, a struggle of the international proletariat against an anti-Soviet intervention. So here is where it gets more political. It has to do with Soviet interpretations of history um, and the way they were prepared for, uh, for schools. And another one, is more neutral art of Eastern Mediterranean in between um, uh, third and first uh, uh, centuries uh, B BC. Um, so, oh, I actually have that uh, twice. Some of them also have this uh, peculiar, um, you know, artifacts uh, in the beginning of uh, the film uh, strip where it says where the copy was printed. So it was just scribbled with a with a pen on the uh, emulsion. And uh, in, in a few cases, they also contain methodological uh, recommendations for working with uh, films. So for instance, this film is titled Surf Theater. And uh, that there are a few recommendations for how to introduce uh, the film and what questions uh, to ask for discussion. And uh, those recommendations were written by a consultant who was a teacher of a certain school in the Leningrad area, El uh, Kaminska. So, and that's, uh, the, 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 that's the title card uh, from this uh, film. 
then uh, another example, the underwater kingdom. So uh, from this example, you can really see that uh, this films um, range a wide variety of subjects. In most cases, it was also indicated for uh, what age or what grades uh, the films were recommended as a supplement to. Uh, to the school uh, program. So what we did with them um, was uh, sort them by the type of reel, and there were three types, one that were called small, the other one medium-sized reels, uh, and, a small, and, and those medium-sized uh, size reels could be single or double, so we laid them out like that and uh, arranged in boxes. Each one has a number, so that... Uh, here are a few more examples. And we, uh, so we put them in um, self-storage uh, just on, on the outskirts of um, St. Petersburg. Uh, the contents of each of the books are photographed. That's the maximum we were able to do. And uh, they were waiting for um, to be ship, ship, uh, shipped to the United uh, States, but uh, that tend to be a, turned out to be a lengthier process than we um, anticipated. So that's that's where they are uh, right now still. Uh, the self-storage seems to be the best uh, option for storing them uh, right now because um, it's environmentally controlled and the temperature is supported at 17 to 18 degrees Celsius, which is actually quite good for uh, for uh, film. So um, this is where uh, they are. And this is, um, again, uh, school film uh, films uh, circulate uh, on YouTube. It's also, also possible to buy uh, reels uh, on, uh, on the internet. Um, but um, so, so this, is, this is the largest collection I have encountered so far as a collection. So they are here all uh, together and uh, digitizing them in a, a better quality than what's found on the um, uh, on YouTube uh, right now would uh, actually yield some uh, pretty uh, spectacular audiovisual uh, materials uh, illustrating um, uh, the, the ways that um, school subjects uh, and various uh, parts of uh, you know human history and and life were uh, presented to school children so i call it the history of pedagogy also the history of um, uh, worldview the way it was uh, again disseminated during uh, the soviet times but at the same time it is also a very um, you know, uh, spectacular uh, audiovisual uh, stores that I know uh, filmmakers working with uh, found footage get particularly enthusiastic about. Uh, so the uh, oftentimes um, the footage in these films was reused uh, from popular science films and newsreels, although it was never annotated. So we can only guess, but never know for sure. And also the quality of camera work of uh, varies depending on where uh, the footage was obtained. Um, as it was it, um, explained to me by uh, the filmmaker Slava Zuckerman, currently living in New York, um, uh, most famous for his film A Liquid Sky that uh, he made in uh, 1982. Um, so uh, he, he worked uh, at Skoll Film in the very beginning of his career as a filmmaker. He actually began still when he was at film school. And at film school, uh, Skoll Film was viewed as a way uh, to provide uh, students with uh, paid employment while at the same time practice uh, their skills. And uh, it is extremely difficult to research uh, the specifics of the history of school film because so far I have not found a published uh, source uh, on it. And um, mainly what, uh, what I know is from uh, people formerly employed uh, with uh, school film. So uh, when I think about the potential and uh, the options for a digitized online uh, collection created for uh, primarily for educational in institutions, I have uh, one example in my mind, and that is uh, one precedent, and that is the collection titled uh, Socialism on, uh, I'm sorry, not on celluloid, uh, Socialism on Film uh, by Adam Matthew, uh, which is the company speciali that specializes in um, 
creating collections of primary sources for, uh, again, academic uh, institutions. So uh, the collection was uh, created about 10 uh, years ago, and uh, the, the, uh, it was based on a collection of uh, about 5,000 reels at the British Film Institute. Um, the collection uh, was, uh, was created by uh, Stanley uh, Foreman, who uh, had uh, connections with uh, with the Communist Party. And we can see that a lot of these uh, films uh, were clearly distributed via these Communist Party channels. Um, many of them are uh, dubbed into uh, English, Spanish, and uh, other languages. And um, so for this uh, collection, uh, Adam, the Adam Matthew Company digitized about 2,000 reels and created metadata uh, as well as uh, historical reference uh, articles, uh, essays. So uh, here are some of the uh, quick links uh, on the website. So it illustrates the nature and scope of the collection. There are a few video interviews related to it, and there are essays, quite short, written uh, by uh, scholars who also acted as curators for this um, collection. So uh, here are examples of the essays, for instance, documentary film and the role of women in the USSR by uh, Melanie Illich from University of uh, Gloucester, uh, Gloucestershire. And um, uh, similar topics can be found in, uh, in the school film uh, films as well. So um, they also created uh, a list of topics by which the films could be uh, searched. And Dmitry Frangulov has demonstrated uh, what this online uh, system at Eastview does. So my understanding is, is uh, that it is possible to, um, to create something uh, similar. So, the, uh, so metadata would really uh, enable us uh, to search uh, those uh, films. And uh, I think they have a great potential uh, for using in the classroom because uh, they uh, they uh, seem to be an excellent um, uh, you know resource for student uh, research uh, papers and uh, the, uh, for for uh, for a variety of uh, courses. It may be on the Soviet history. It may also be uh, broader on the something on the Russian culture. And I remember. Um, uh, so uh, Anne Lounsbury, the chair of uh, the Department of uh, Russian uh, Studies at NYU mentioned uh, at one point uh, her idea to teach uh, a course related to Siberia in the Russian culture. Perhaps it's happening this semester even. And I imagine that uh, films in a collection such as this uh, could also be um, a source for, uh, for the assignment uh, to uh, work uh, with. Also, films help to understand uh, films. So again, when I worked with the uh, Adam Matthew uh, collection, I uh, used it to uh, put in context a collection of um, a, a film collection uh, at NYU libraries of uh, films of the U uh, U.S. Uh, Communist uh, Party. So comparing uh, them, looking at how they were uh, dubbed, uh, for instance, uh, that, that, that just, uh, it just really helps to make a sense of this uh, film objects, the artifacts that are otherwise, uh, that otherwise can be quite uh, puzzling at times. And uh, finally, and actually I, I am not sure uh, what uh, the, um, streaming platform um, uh, adopted by Eastview uh, can do in this respect. But I think the genre of um, the video essay is becoming more and more important in the academic um, uh, setting. So uh, I think video essay is not exactly a short film, although it has a lot of commonalities with it. A video essay is a combination of working with uh, the uh, moving images and uh, writing. So video essays often include uh, significant annotations, quotations, and uh, they uh, oftentimes they help uh, to make um, a point about the subject in a compelling way. But at the same time, I think in pedagogy, when we teach, we al always uh, pursue more than uh, one goal. So on the one hand, we teach students about a subject, say, I don't know, history of the Soviet 1930s. But at the same time, we teach, um, uh, we inevitably teach them uh, what we call transferable skills when we require them to write essays. Um, so it may be an essay again on the uh, history of the Soviet 30s, but 
uh, what we teach them here is also to write in general. And writing is one of the crucial skills uh, acquired by people who pursue uh, college education. So um, working with uh, a variety of media, with a great variety of media beyond text is uh, becoming more and more important today. And I think this is one of the uh, transferable skills we could teach uh, to uh, students. And um, Motion pictures uh, continue to occupy a rather marginal place in our study of history. Uh, the French sociologist uh, Pierre Sorlan uh, in the late 1970s wrote uh, his um, famous book on um, film, uh, on, on the study of film in history, and uh, he was um, making uh, so the argument he, he is making in the introduction of this book is that uh, historians tend to uh, fall behind in the st study of film as a result people not trained as historians uh, tell history with uh, the moving images without consulting historians so he was urging historians to uh, to adopt a greater knowledge of motion pictures. And while uh, these days we, of course, uh, have a, a much better toolkit for working with motion pictures, because at the time Sorlan was uh, writing this book, even accessing films um, was uh, a very difficult process. It involved watching uh, each uh, reel on, uh, you know, on, on the projector or a flat bed, uh, bed a viewing table. Uh, these days we can digitize films, uh, we can create metadata. Uh, we can really uh, work uh, with them in in a in a manner that enables us to uh, watch them in large uh, numbers and synthesize uh, the information we find from them to create uh, new forms of knowledge. So um, I think uh, school film. Uh, again, has a great potential to be uh, one such collection, perhaps uh, not an exhaustive uh, window on the Soviet history and culture, but it is a serial. In a way, it is similar to other serials uh, that Eastview has uh, digitized only in print, such as the Pravda newspaper or uh, the journal Iskustvo Kino, the art of uh, cinema with which I have worked uh, a lot and the, the way they made it searchable really um, was significant for my research. So I think school film can be processed in a uh, similar way. So I will end at this point and will gladly uh, take questions if you have them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maria, for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. I'm looking at the list of uh, questions already and uh, I think, uh, Carolyn, I, I saw the uh, one of the participants, uh, I think John Julian raised the hand. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, John, do you have a question? Maybe if you can put it in the chat window or um, Marie, if you could hand the host back to me and I can, I can turn John's. Um... I have just done that. Okay. Okay. See. If you'd like to talk, John, go ahead. Um, I actually did not have a question. I must have. Oh, you just raised your hand. Okay, hello. <laughs> All right. Anybody else has questions? Please go ahead and post them to the chat. Or um, I see that there is one that we've gotten um, that was sent to us previously. Um, other than school films, um, do you know of any other collections like this that might be of interest to researchers? Um, they exist and they exist in large numbers. To begin with, um, there are a few uh, universities in uh, the United States that uh, have collections of um, films of the Soviet uh, period. So again, NYU libraries, Stamman uh, collection has one such collection of the communist party uh, USA. And um, there, are, uh, there are other uh, institutions um, as well. So for instance, if there is interest among librarians, those collections could be uh, digitized and uh, put on the streaming platform. And in Russia, uh, film preservation in general 
finds itself in a rather uh, preservation of uh, non-theatrical films at least finds itself in a rather uh, tragic um, uh, condition so there are a lot of collections that are neglected and there is also a little awareness of what a film uh, is so uh, in many cases People believe that uh, if um, a film was digitized at home, you know, you just put a, a white sheet on the wall and um, project uh, the film there and shoot it with, with a video camera. It's digitized. It's put on YouTube, so it is preserved. So it is. It is. We we call it remediation. So we know this film's in a remediated state. Um, but of course, uh, it would actually be great uh, to do uh, to do better. And many of them are, again, excellent historical uh, sources. So I know a few private collections of experimental films uh, of um, the Perestroika era, the 80s and uh, early 90s. Uh, again, very few of them are digitized. So we know some of the works that we can describe as canonic. Uh, for instance, the uh, necrorealist films made in Leningrad, uh, also only some of them, but not all. And then uh, films created by the Sinif Phantom Circle in Moscow, the Aleinikov brothers and, and other people, but there were a lot more. And there are some private collections um, I, I know at least one in uh, St. Petersburg that are safe in the filmmaker's home, but they don't get uh, di di dis uh, disseminated. Also, there are film collections at uh, museums and film tends to be such an obscure medium that museums usually don't mention uh, films as a, part, uh, as a part of their holdings. So I know that, for example, uh, the theater museum in St. Petersburg has films on 16 millimeter, um, uh, film, which they would uh, be happy to uh, digitize, but they don't even attempt to secure funds for that because somehow it seems uh, to be a very exotic area uh, still. But those are really, um, you know, unique materials in the history of ballet uh, in particular. And ballet, of course, is uh -huh. one um, that is very hard to record without the uh, motion uh, pictures. There are amateur films. Uh, also, something I became aware of fairly recently is uh, the Ghost Catalog project uh, of, of the Russian Ministry of Culture. This is the initiative uh, that aspires to uh, have a photograph of each object in the collections of museums countrywide and uh, put them online in this database uh, that should be searchable. And there are films there as well, but they're not easy to find. Uh, you have to go to the other uh, category and, and uh, look for film reels, which are presented as artifacts, so the cans, as opposed to uh, motion uh, pictures. So approaching those, and, and oftentimes these are small uh, museums of local uh, history or factory museums and, um, I have talked to a few directors and curators and uh, when they hear the word film scanner, they get extremely uh, enthusiastic about any opportunity to get uh, them uh, scanned. Also, uh, because these films, uh, many of these films could be described as orphan films these days. So they don't, uh, that the owner is uncertain. And in a way that makes it easier uh, to overcome the copyright issues that make, um, uh, you know, making films available digitally uh, a very costly uh, endeavor. So yeah, this, these are some examples, but there are a lot more collections that could potentially be included if there is interest. Um, I, uh, yeah, thank you, Maria. I have, I have a question uh, too. Uh, um, I noticed uh, from watching some of the uh, school films uh, uh, reels that uh, Quite a number of them are in hard sciences. There's a, in chemistry, physics, and so on. Could you tell us if you know what's the proportion of social science films or on history, geography, and so on versus hard sciences? Uh, thank you, Dmitry. It's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, so when I was browsing the photographs of the reels in the collection that I took uh, more, more than two years ago, I actually saw a good deal of films 
related to history, also literature. There are films on uh, specific writers like Pushkin, Lermontov, Mayakovsky, uh, so poets and, and writers, Tolstoy, uh, some of them in uh, several uh, parts. And um, I have a sense that um, the prevalence of hard science may reflect what uh, is more likely to be uploaded to uh, YouTube, because I think the ideological uh, undertones are much, uh, you know, more obvious in humanities, in the humanities and social um, sciences, whereas hard sciences such as physics and films and physics are among the most interesting because to illustrate um, abstract uh, concepts, one has to be really uh, creative. So, um, but also biology, of, of, uh, for instance. So uh, the ideological message is much harder to read there. Although, of course, it's present uh, every, uh, everywhere because uh, biological systems are also systems. So it would be interesting to analyze how they are described. So to, to answer uh, your question, uh, hard sciences may be prevalent or they may um, reflect what is being uploaded to YouTube because they look cool. <laughs> and again, uh, they, they uh, are not so heavily, heavily ideological. But I have a sense, uh, so from my experience, that uh, humanities and hard sciences are more or less equally uh, distributed there. Carolyn, do we have any other questions uh, to Maria? Carolyn, you're muted. Carolyn, you're muted. We cannot hear you. I think that she, basically you sort of answered the question um, that I had in your previous question. Um, are there mostly science films or are there any humanities mm -hmm. of the school film collections on YouTube or just a select mm -hmm. few? Okay, so if uh, if there, by the way, I just noticed that Nikita Tikhonov Rao just joined us. I, I know he sent me an email that he had uh, internet problems. He's in Moscow right now, uh, some kind of internet issues. Uh, Nikita, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hi, oh, Dmitry. Okay. Hello, uh, perfect. Uh, we don't see you though. Uh, really? Yeah, no, can you turn no. on? Uh, <clears throat> well, the video is turned on. I wonder why you yeah. don't see me. Well, you see, we see your, you saw your picture for a second. Um, I don't know why. Oops, maybe I could uh, reconnect again and you will see the video. Let's try it again. Yep, let's do that. In the meantime, any other questions to Maria? Maria, this is a, certainly a very interesting project to, to consider uh, if there's enough interest among li libraries. Uh, I see the several chain challenges. All of them are, you know, are, easy, are solvable, but there are still challenges. One is to find out the rights. I mean, are, are we sure that these are really orphan films or not? Once we figure out the rights, then we have to think about shipping. How do we get them through Russian customs? And uh, what can, because I can imagine there can be a lot of challenges there. Once we bring them uh, the reels here, then we need to digitize them. That should be pretty easy. We digitized before, and uh, this is just a simple things to do. Then I see the next step is to annotate them. I mean, somebody has to go through and uh, create metadata, annotate it, and then we platformize it. We put it on our platform, and hopefully, then we can have uh, people uh, uh, access it. So there are several steps that. Um, uh, can be uh, certainly can be made, but um, but there are challenging steps as well. Uh, can I respond to some of uh, those points? Uh, yes. Yeah, so so uh, shipping again. Uh, we have uh, con uh, conducted quite. Uh, a lot of research on how to do that. We have contact with a with a, a shipping company, and we know what to do for that on the uh, Russian um, side. It's just that we, um, you know, there the, the were a variety of issues that NYU Libraries has encountered while um, preparing that project, and we simply didn't get to the step of uh, shipping them. Uh, but at the same time, I think it is also uh, possible to send them without shipping to Russia. Perhaps in a way, it would be more e it would be easier to ship um, a scanner 
uh, or uh, I, I don't know, the Museum of um, Cinema in Moscow uh, does uh, 16 millimeter scanning uh, and that's uh, pretty affordable at 100 uh, rubles per minute, which is uh, about a dollar and a half, so one dollar fifty per minute. So there, there are options here, and again, there are uh, some um, more or less portable uh, film scanners on the market uh, right now. So that's something to consider. Of course, I would be concerned about the fate of the film prints, and if um, there are libraries, there are other libraries in again university libraries in the United States that would be interested in, in adopting them because these are very important uh, artifacts uh, and um, you know uh, preserving them together with uh, all those uh, little slips but also just an example of uh, those uh, film prints would would also be you know an, an important project um, so I'm, I'm glad I'm just glad to have this opportunity to spread the word about the collection um, when it comes, so the copyright issue, uh, we would have to ask uh, the legal specialists. I know that, uh, for instance, in uh, Europe, um, uh, orphan uh, film is um, a legal category. And um, so, so an orphan film is defined uh, as a film whose uh, right uh, owners could not be found uh, within a diligent search. And then there is a definition of what is diligent search. So posting a note in the newspaper um, or uh, some, something uh, similar. So, so that would be a question to, uh, to legal uh, specialists. But my sense is that it, it wouldn't be uh, such a big issue because uh, unlike other uh, nonfiction uh, film studios of the Soviet period, uh, there doesn't seem to be an apparent heir to, uh, to school film. Um, so again, that would have to be decided. Annotating, uh, yes, that's quite a bit of work, but I wonder if we would also consider uh, crowdsourcing uh, that part, perhaps. Um, so for instance, there is the uh, Media Ecology Project based uh, at Dartmouth, and uh, th th that's an example of, uh, the, so, so they have built a video annotation uh, tool uh, that is often crowdsourced. So that, there, are, there are options here that again need to be discussed. Thank you. Very, very well, thank you so much, Maria. Uh, uh, finally, we have Nikita tikhonov Rao here. Nikita, welcome. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, formally you. Nikita is a member of a Russian guild of documentary and TV films and European documentary network. He is the producer and director of more than 30 documentaries on social issues in Russia, including The Labels, the film about mental health, In Out, it's a film about autism and others. He's been promoting the development of cinema as a social tool in Russia via another producing company, uh, Third Sector, Third Sector Laboratory. He's also one, one of the founders of the Art Video Studio, a production company specializing in TV and creative film production about social issues. Nikita has been a winner of a number of international and Russian film festivals. And during this session, we will demonstrate several trailers of works produced by Nikita. Um, Nikita, so uh, the floor is yours and uh, please go ahead. Okay, Dmitry, thank you so much. I'm really glad to join today's Zoom meeting. Um, it's an opportunity for me to tell some words about the landscape of uh, documentary filmmaking in Russia. Um, I, I, I didn't hear all the speech of Maria. I think she has covered a lot of things, but I didn't hear that. Uh, I had some problems with the internet connection. But so finally, I solved them. Okay, so uh, the first thing I would like to say is that uh, in Russia, documentary filmmaking has really, really great roots because it all started with Ziga Vertov in the beginning of the 21st century. And uh, it was a new language of documentary filmmaking. And uh, Russia indeed has a great, uh, great, great story of documentary filmmaking development in Soviet times and in the new times of uh, Russian filmmaking. Uh, <clears throat> the landscape of the industry here in Russia is far away from what it is in the United States because of course in the United States documentary filmmaking is really very 
progressive and uh, it's a very strong industry with uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, I think. But uh, in Russia, the, <clears throat> the landscape is like this. Well, we have, uh, we have some government, uh, government uh, organizations. The first to mention is the Ministry of Culture, which is uh, the basic institution which uh, provides annual uh, finance support uh, to, to the production companies. And I think it's something about 15, 20 millions of dollars annually spent by the government uh, for documentary films. And the number of films supported annually here in Russia is uh, from 50 to 100 films, um, well, annually. When the films are done, they all go to the Krasnogorsk archive, and it's a really big archive of uh, documentary films uh, produced by the, by the, with the government support. Uh, the topics uh, covered by the uh, by, by by these films is absolutely different uh, from social issues, from arts and uh, culture and science and innovations and human stories uh, to to um, I would say so. Uh, well, the, the the topics are very different, but um, of course. Uh, we have a tradition, and I would say that in the Soviet times, uh, documentary films were part of the propaganda. Now, it's not all like this, but of course, a lot of films, they really cover and they raise a lot of social issues, uh, topics. And um, for, for, for in Russia, where a lot of social issues, uh, we have, so we have a lot of social issues. And uh, I think that uh, films, they are a tool for uh, bringing people's attention to these problems and the way to solve them. So for me, the idea of impact filmmaking, which is very like popular and uh, it's a trend in uh, documentary filmmaking worldwide, I would say that some com such companies, for example, as Participant Media or the Doc Society, the, um, uh, well, different institutions in UK and United States, they develop these type of approaches to documentary filmmaking. And it really, uh, I'm a great fan of these approaches because I think that uh, when films raise some problems and if we have some uh, methodology of um, evaluation of social effects of them, it could work. Um, I would like to show you one of the independent films which my, my company has made, and it was the beginning of our, of our production company. We produced it in 2012. It is called in Russian, v -Aute, and in English, it's in out. Now, let's see the trailer. Can we turn it on? Я Соня Шаталова. У меня неумелые руки и нет речи, поэтому звучит не мой голос. Я аутист. Когда аутичный ребенок делает вот так вот, вот так вот, да, в этот момент он смотрит вон туда. Причем очень внимательно, просто это периферическое зрение, которое позволяет ему так не ярко, немножко размыто, но разглядывать все. Аутизм – это жизнь в нигде и никогда. И одновременно везде и всегда. Все получается, все получается, Соня. По компьютеру ты не стучишь. То что сейчас происходит со мной, может кому-то казаться бедой. Плохо хочу, то резвлюсь, как шальная. Можно подумать, и вправду больная. 
они могут запоминать, там, не знаю, вот так энциклопедию пролистнул и запомнил ее. И этот ребенок может решать там уникальные какие-то уравнения, но при этом он не может там, сам сделать себе бутерброд. Он просто физически не понимает, как это сделать. Мне один чиновник сказал как-то, когда я ему обратилась за помощью, а вы понимаете, что это ваш крест, и вы не должны сбрасывать его на государство. Почему мир так жесток к себе? Ведь Бог задумал совсем другое. В нем мучительные чувства злобы и страха, когда они выплескиваются вовне. Время накрывает русичей толстой пеленой прошлого. И все эти темные чувства, как нарывы, зреют внутри ауры народа. So it was. Um, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So a few words about this project. So we made it uh, almost 10 years ago, and it was the first documentary film covering the topic of uh, people with autism. And uh, I would say that after this film, and after it was premiered here in Russia, um, it really brought a lot of attention to autistic people. And the, since then, the situation has changed tremendously. And I think that part of these changes became, um, came to life because of the film. And uh, uh, at this very moment, we made a press conference in one of the leading Russian news agencies. And uh, there was the Mr. Pan Gimun, who was invited uh, in these days here in Russia and the day 2nd of April, 2013, we have brought this big topic to, to, to people's attention. And it was supported by the United Nations and it really made a big, uh, big changes here in Russia. <clears throat> so uh, another thing which we made about the film is that it was the first independent documentary film which was brought to screens uh, all over Russia uh, without any support of a distribution company. So we made it ourselves as a production. We made a full cycle of um, um, production and distribution. Um, and uh, since then we work with, this, with these approaches. Um, well, getting back to the topic of the industry landscape, I would say that today in Russia um, exists something like 300, 400 independent film productions and uh, independent film producers. I mean, only in documentary filmmaking. It's a big community and uh, the people are absolutely, they work in very different artistic and uh, production ways. Some of the films are real blockbusters. Some of them are, uh, I would say, um, are independent films, which can, you cannot see on television. And um, as in each country, of course, we have uh, television, which also commissions documentary films. We have a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous uh, raise, uh, tremendous rise of, uh, uh, of uh, internet platforms. Uh, and I would say that in Russia, we have something like 10 independent Netflixes, because uh, for the last year, this, um, this type of business has risen almost 60% year to year. And uh, I think that this, this big 
um, this big um, rise in uh, internet platform has uh, is is possible because of the pandemic and because of the COVID, and um, because all the all the people are like at home, they want to watch content, and uh, it's a big chance for content makers to to bring something new to the to the people. Um, of course, we have business and uh, socially uh, responsible business, which also invests money in documentary filmmaking. Um, and um, we have independent funds which work with uh, filmmaking companies, which also invest into, into, into filmmaking. Um, well, I would like to tell you to show you another trailer of another of our projects, which was made in 2014. And it was a film supported by the Ministry of Culture and it was devoted to far east of Russia. So let's see the trailer. It's called uh, in Russian, it's called uh, and in English it's called straightening side. Впервые в Владивостоке, вообще на Дальнем Востоке впервые. Ну как здесь у вас вообще жизнь? Вот вы вдумайтесь только, вот мы сейчас с вами сидим на, на территорию, куда люди шли, получается, пешком. А скажите, самая большая скорость, которую вы... Не скажете? Я думаю, что у нас век, в котором мы живем, это век расслабленных. Мы с точки зрения хозяина, да, теряем вот, вот эту способность быть хозяином. Мне иногда кажется, что мы были просто не готовы вот к этому обществу потребления с огромного количеством яркого, но одноразового. То есть мы просто психологически к этому не были готовы. И двери открылись, и мы туда ломанулись толпой. Здесь были захоронения, братские могилы, скажем так. Я куда скидывали людей и закапывали. В частности, вот у Осипа Емельевича Мандельштам. Вы знаете, что здесь раньше было на месте этих домов? А для тебя какая родина? Ужасная, очень ужасная. Я вообще тут жить бы не хотел. Я в самую худшую страну, кроме этой, бы переехала лучше бы, чем вот тут вот жить. So these two films, uh, which I showed you the trailers, In Out and The Straight Inside, they had uh, a really good uh, festival uh, screenings uh, in Russia and outside of Russia. And I would like to say, to say some words about the, about the festival movement of Russia. Mm. Uh, guys, can you hear me? Okay. 
So I would mention some of the major documentary f- festivals of Russia. One of them is um, a festival which is called Art Doc Fest, and it is run by the one of the acclaimed uh, Russian uh, film directors, Vitaly Mansky. Um, it's a it's a festival with the most interesting, I would say, uh, Russian films which have uh, international potential of distribution. Another film festival, which is also very important, uh, it was founded uh, by Irina Shatalova, and uh, it is called Doker. Uh, It's a film which concentrates mostly on uh, um, foreign films brought here to Russia for the Russian spectators to have a possibility to to see uh, films from abroad. Another film festival which is devoted to the people with disabilities is called Kino uh, Bez Barrierov, Films Without Boundaries. And it's a, it's a film festival uh, founded by uh, Denise Rosa, uh, who, is, um, an Ameri- who has American citizenship. And it's a fantastic woman, which I know for more than 10 years. And she's a real altruist in um, bringing here to Russia best uh, films about people with disabilities. But it's also very, it's a great festival also to see Russian films uh, raising this topic. Another film which is devoted to scientific and educational film is called The World of Knowledge. And it's well, also very good. Also, one of the major film festivals is the festival uh, which is called Russia. And uh, it, it takes place in Yekaterinburg. It's uh, Ur- Ural's um, capital of Russia. Uh, so we also have plenty of festivals uh, such as, for example, Meet Russia, which is devoted to touristic films. And also I would mention one of the film festivals, which is called Flyer Tiana, which takes, takes place in the city of Perm. And it's a very interesting film festival, which I really uh, advise as a place to look for interest in Russian documentary films, uh, which is created in a very specific uh, way. Uh, the films uh, which are screened there uh, are made in some kind of um, observational methodology of documentary filmmaking. It means then that there are no all, there are no speaking heads, there are no uh, other format elements which are very common for documentary filmmaking. It means that the camera and the directors who shoot these films they spent part of these of their lives with uh, their protagonists and the protagonists get um, get used to the camera and it gives the directors the possibility to live part of protagonists life together so the films become very sincere and very true um okay um, I would suggest to see the next trailer, which uh, about a very interesting place here in Russia, in the north of Russia, which is called Teriberka. And the world knows this place by the film of uh, Andrei Zvyaginsev, an acclaimed Russian director, fictional films director. Uh, and one of, the, one of his films which is called Leviathan, was shot there. And uh, it brought to the screen the most dramatic and uh, tragic story of a protagonist of this, of this film. And it rose a great discussion here in Russia about the places in Russian province. So let's see the trailer, Terry Burke Alive. Дача на Северном Ледовитом океане. Как звучит вообще? (смех) 
здесь какая-то сумасшедшая энергетика абсолютная. За Левиафана едут сюда иностранцы. Все, они посмотрели Левиафан вот, и хотят воочию увидеть. Все похерено, все разрушено. Я и должен быть этим человеком, который должен туда поехать вот, и попробовать что-то такое там решить. Я не хочу уезжать, но мне придется просто здесь негде работать. За границей везут нам и бребешков, и мидий. А, блин, более высокое качество, оно вот здесь вот под ногами. Главное сокровище не холодильник сегодня. Родина, Русь, Святая Русь. Поэтому давайте начнем. таким ветром и дождем тоже. Изменить жизнь Териберки они не смогут никогда. Я в этом абсолютно уверена. Я верю в то, что в принципе любой человек, делая что-то у себя прямо под ногами и немножко шире, только так может менять реальность. никто не видит. Яги. So, it's a film about this place, which is called Teriberka, and uh, about the, the main protagonist of the film is a Russian uh, social entrepreneur, whose name is Boris Akimov. And he decided that why shall we, well, cry about the destiny of this um, place uh, forgotten by God? Uh, let's do something about it. Let's, um, let's, uh, let's make something there, something interesting, which, which will give life to this place. And he made a fantastic festival and he brought a lot of tourists there. And it was gastronomical, it was culture, it was uh, films, it was a lot of activities in this festival. And uh, finally, uh, uh, this place has transformed into one of the leading regions of touristic activities here in Russia. So the people really want to go there and to, to have fun there. And uh, I think that uh, the film, our film, contributed a lot to a new destiny of this place. And it's the way film can be used as to a social tool and uh, cultural events can be used as social tool for transforming territories. Um, and uh, also, I would like to tell you a few words about the, one of the latest Uh, our projects, which is called um, I Volunteer, I Am Volunteer. It, this film was shot in 2018. It was uh, uh, made uh, by our company when in Russia, well, in Russia now, every year, each year is devoted to some specific topic. For example, uh, 2016 was the year of cinema. 2018 was the year of Um, volunteers, volunteer movement. Uh, now 2021 is the year of um, science here in Russia. So it helps Russian society to bring more attention to these topics. And we shot this film in 2018 and it was the, the year of volunteer movement. And the film is a blockbuster, which, uh, which is like uh, 100, uh, one, one hour and a half, which lasts one hour and a half. And it covers all the major topics of Russian volunteer movement. And it gives a big picture of, of this uh, social phenomena. Uh, today, Russia is considered one of the leading countries in volunteers movement. And the volunteers of Russia don't not only act here in Russia, but there are really big international missions of them. So let's see the trailer and I will say some words about it, this, this project. Who 
Кто такой волонтер? Это человек, который помогает здесь и сейчас. Мы все взаимосвязаны, поэтому легко отдавать. Люди, которые жертвуют своим временем на алтарь чужой беды, отдают свои собственные соки жизни, это без сомнения герой. Переломным, можно сказать, моментом была работа по спасению семьи касаток зажатых во льдах. Когда ты вот видишь результат здесь и сейчас, это просто супер ощущение, когда то, что ты делаешь, приносит кому-то пользу. Есть вещи, к которым нельзя привыкнуть, когда мы не успеваем в ходе поисков ребенка. Он помогает мне выступать, лекции читать и так далее. Это уже признаки духовного родства. Очень малое количество людей готовы усыновлять таких детей уже, уже в возрасте подростка. По-хорошему, что можно сделать, это просто закрыть все детские дома, поместить всех, всех детей в, в семьи. Ни капли не верю в чудо, кому-то молюсь порой. Возьмите меня отсюда, возьмите меня домой. Вам нравится? Конечно. Самое главное. Окей. Okay. So this project uh, was made by us not only as a um, uh, documentary film, but, but a very, very big uh, media project. project. And um, it had a fantastic uh, coverage here in Russia. The audience of this film was something about 12 uh, million people. We had uh, internet partners, social networks, which uh, so we had a lot of videos um, in the internet covering this topic. And it was used as a, not only as a artistic uh, film, it was, uh, it was a film which helped to to bring people to volunteer movement. And we had something like 15 independent uh, NGOs uh, connected to this project. And uh, we had uh, mm, a really big campaign, impact campaign uh, in this film. And, and now we have, uh, we have, we also made a big report uh, uh, devoted to the results of this project. Uh, it is not translated into English, but it really made a big uh, effect on Russian life. Uh, well, during the last 10 years, our company has produced more than 30 documentary films. I think that also I need to mention a film which, which had a very big European and Chinese distribution, which is called Children of the State. And it's a film, uh, a social issues uh, film devoted to Magnitsky Act and the story of Dima uh, Yakovlev law, which prohibited uh, Americans to adopt Russian children. Uh, this film also has English subtitles, and I think it would be some interest to, to, to people in the US. Um, Now our company concentrates not only on documentary filmmaking, but we also make fiction films and series. Uh, one of our latest projects is called Lost and Found, and it is devoted to one of the leading NGOs of Russia, which is called Lisa Alert. And it's an NGO which helps to find uh, people who are lost. Uh, in Russia, hundreds of thousands of people annually get lost in forests, in the cities, and this NGO helps to find them. We made this project in uh, interactive format, 
which has a very strong educational uh, and uh, educational layer. And it's also, it's not only a film, it's a game. It's, uh, and each, each spectator, spectator can, 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 can play this game on a special website. And there are some quizzes, some um, interactive uh, formats, which the people can enjoy. Um, well, um, I would be happy if uh, some of the films which have, we have produced would be of interest for the people who really are interested in Russian life, not only the positive uh, and negative parts of this, of this life, but uh, some true uh, some true life, because each of the films we made is, uh, is a window to see real life here in Russia. Well, <laughs> I would say that uh, most of the things which I wanted to say uh, I have covered. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Yes. Nikita, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Um, I hope <coughs> that we can successfully negotiate some kind of agreement with you to bring the films that uh, you produced to the Western market, especially to the US academic market. But I know that there were some questions, I can see some questions already coming. And actually, Maria, there was also a question to you as well. So maybe let's start with questions to Nikita first, and then we'll switch to question to Maria. Uh, Carolyn, do you see the? Sure. Um, well, one of the questions we had was, um, can you explain a little bit more what impact filmmaking is in general? Yeah, that's sure. for Nikita. Well, uh, impact filmmaking is the concept of um, film not only as a произведение искусства a piece of art, film is not only a piece of art, film can also be a very strong uh, tool to change people's lives. So to make an impact project, you need to make four steps. Uh, first of all, the producer produ production company should have some people who know uh, social uh, te technology, social methodology, of changing people's behavior. So the first thing to do is determine a problem which we try to solve with a film. So together with our partners, with the NGOs, we formulate a problem that the media project or a film can solve. Then we form a pool of uh, partners. We make key messages and we start production uh understanding what we want to change then we need to produce the second step is to produce this media content so we need to shoot and ed edit the film and uh, understand that this film can influence the target audience to achieve social change the next step is uh, the distribution because the classical distribution of a film it is uh, the, well, the main, the main objectives of such distribution in the um, film industry are box office and festival, uh, festival, uh, festival success. But the third dimension which we have an impact project is uh, the social effects, which can be direct and indirect, which can be qualitative and quantitative, which can be short term and long term, and we need to uh, we need to understand the way film will work for different audiences, and also how it will work for people who take decisions. I mean, politicians, uh, people from business, and we need to start not only classical distribution, which have which will have box office and festival. Uh, festival success but we also need to make an impact distribution which will bring uh, 
communities energy, uh, which will help communities solve the problems raised by the film. And the most important step is to understand how we influenced our target audience. So for that, for that, we need to implement a system of evaluation uh, of such projects. And uh, as I said before, we have a lot of uh, ways to measure these F effects. So these are the four steps which, um, which, uh, which, which is where is the difference between classical film production and impact filmmaking. Well, whew, finally, I did it. I explained it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, maybe the next question for Professor Vinogradova. Um, this is from Liladar. Uh, thank you for your wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, what are some of the challenges that are not only related to preservation of these endangered film roles, but also related to ensuring the long-term access to the content of these films outside of the Russian Federation? And maybe you want to answer that first part. Mm -hmm. first. So can you repeat the first part, please? Oh. Um, it's, it, is a, it is kind of addressing um, Professor Vinogradova's um, presentation. So um, I'm hoping that it's maybe a question she... To, question to Maria. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for this uh, question. And again, uh, the question is about the challenges of not only preservation, but also ensuring the long term access outside of the Russian Federation. So I would say that the long term um, issues related to the long term access are actually uh, the same in Russia as well as, as outside of it. And that is ensuring a stability of the digital objects um, that we create by uh, digitizing films. And uh, in Russia, especially, there is very little awareness of it. Again, a few people understand, and I, I uh, constantly explain this to my um, students, uh, especially in my uh, film uh, studies methodology class, that YouTube uh, is uh, not uh, a classical uh, archive. It is a selection of something that was digitized to be put there and that can disappear at um, any time. So, Again, creating um, so, so digital preservation uh, involves a multi uh, step um, uh, process that ensures that uh, the files are mirrored uh, in several uh, places on the web so that if something happens to one of those digital files, it, it is preserved uh, elsewhere. So in Russia, I often um, came across uh, this um, point of view expressed even by professional professionally trained um, film and photography archivists that if a film is scanned and put on an external drive, it is preserved. Uh, it is not. Uh, because uh, again, library, uh, digital library specialists have conferences uh, d d dedicated to subjects such as the stability of the JPEG format. We are dealing here with uh, the formats that are um, created by private corporations and uh, that are pushed into obsolescence oftentimes faster than uh, we are able to realize what happened. So this is, this is the main um, uh, challenge, spreading awareness of the fact that uh, digital files are not uh, permanent until they're made. So although this is probably not a 100% um, guarantee, um, yes, and these are the same in Russia as well as outside of it, although I would say right now in the United States, uh, there are uh, several very important uh, academic programs in uh, film preservation, so uh, the awareness is much greater here than, uh, than in Russia, but to me this is mm -hmm. the main challenge. And the second part of the question was about the opportunities that these challenges present us with. Um, I'm afraid, I, I don't want to be a pessimist, but I would say uh, that the opportunity is to just lose our film. Uh, so it's, it's better to overcome this as fast as we can. And this is a really urgent issue. So thank you. Carolyn, any other questions uh, to Nikita? I'd like to open the floor if anybody else has any more questions. There is uh, one more that we can that I'd like to address to Nikita. Um, some of your films are financed by the Russian government bodies. Uh, 
Do you feel that the Russian Ministry of Culture has the final word on the direction of your topics of your films? Uh, it's a very, it's not a rare question. The people usually ask this question, not only from the United States, but also here in Russia. Uh, well, during 10 years of working with the Ministry of Culture, I never had any problems with censorship. It's true. It's, it doesn't work like this. The first thing is that uh, censorship is prohibited that by the Constitution of Russia. This is the first thing to say. Another thing is that uh, the, um, the, uh, the issues which we bring to the screen, all the people know about that. So it's not, uh, there's nothing, there's nothing we, um, there are no problems telling about this with the, with the cinema, with the cinema, with the films. Uh, television does have censorship, but filmmaking does not. So the, mm. as the Ministry of Culture does not um, play, uh, it's, not, it's not media. It's, uh, it's, a th it's, a, it's a, an institution which helps uh, people to make films, to make films, not, not TV products. So the films, I would say, is a place of total artistic freedom. There, is no, there are no problems with censorship. Okay, great, thank you. It looks like that's all the questions we have. And actually, um, actually, that's the time we had for, for this uh, webinar, exactly hour and a half. So perfect. I want to <laughs> I want to thank our our panelists, uh, Maria, Nikita. Thank you so much for this very interesting presentation. Thank you. I hope some people will come out of this. And, uh, and thank uh, you very much. Yeah, it was and, a great uh, it was a great pleasure to share uh, our vision of of our film industry with uh, the people who are keen to learn more about Russia. And it's an absolute happiness for me to have a possibility to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, the recording of this webinar will be saved, Carolyn Wright, uh, on our website. Yes. Uh, so uh, your colleagues who, who uh, didn't have an opportunity to, uh, to be present at this uh, event uh, will be able to see it later. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sergey and Carolyn, and have a great. Thank you, everyone. Day. Sorry. Thank, Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks.